Thank you for coming to this evening's film. Uh, for those of you who were here for the previous roundtable discussion, thanks for staying. And I, I hope you were able to get a bite to eat during the intermission. Um, I know that I, I promised that if we ran out of food that I would run over to Safeway and I didn't do that, I'm sorry. Um, for those of you who've just arrived, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Steven Salel, and I'm the Robert F. Lange Foundation Assistant Curator of Japanese Art here at the Honolulu Museum of Art. I first saw In the Realm of the Senses back in the 1980s at the recommendation of a friend. He told me that the cinematography by director Oshi Managisa was indescribably beautiful, uh, but he warned me that the film was filled with scenes of unsimulated sex, uh, that these scenes were sometimes uh, rather uncomfortable to watch and that the conclusion of the film is particularly grotesque. My friend was right, and I'd like to pass on that critique to you tonight. Uh, let me emphasize my friend's warning. The film is rated NR17. It's not intended for anybody below the age of 18, nor is it intended for anybody who finds graphic depictions of sexuality to be offensive. Uh, the film contains a very graphic scene of sexual violence at its conclusion. I don't want to leave you, however, with that description, because if I did, you might get the impression that this is a film with little more than sensationalist merit. And in my opinion, that is not the case at all. As Sean Eichmann, the curator of Asian art, and I have tried to emphasize throughout our series of exhibitions on sexually explicit Japanese art, of which the current show, Modern Love, 20th Century Japanese Art, is the conclusion, erotica is, in fact, a sophisticated genre. Sometimes sex is depicted for metaphorical purposes to discuss issues of gender politics, civil rights, and other sorts of cultural developments. Sometimes the artist wants to talk about sex as an act of political or cultural transgression. Rarely is it intended to arouse the viewer. So what were the intentions of director Oshima Nagisa? Firstly, he wanted to relate a famous historical incident that occurred in 1936. The waitress, Abe Sada, played in this film by Matsuda Eiko, and her employer, uh, Ishida Kichizo, played in this film by uh, Fuji Tatsuya, became involved in a sexual relationship that lasted only a single month. Sada's and Kichi's physical attraction to each other became increasingly obsessive and violent, and ultimately Sada killed Kichi through the act of erotic asphyxiation, and then she emasculated the corpse. Now obviously, such a story offers a director many avenues to explore. Uh, probably the most looming question and one that Oshima mainly focuses upon throughout the film is how the couple's relationship spiraled out of control so quickly and dramatically. Another possible approach would be to frame the story in the context of Japanese erotic art and literature, and to some extent, Oshima does this as well. For a few brief minutes, however, I'd like to talk about how the film could be seen as a critique of Japanese history and politics. In 1936, uh, this was an extremely tumultuous chapter 
in Japan's history. Around this time, U.S. Ambassador to Japan Joseph C. Grew reported, quote, the internal economic and financial situation in Japan is serious and may become desperate. The plight of farmers is very bad. Many industries are at low ebb. Unemployment is steadily increasing. The yen is falling and prices have not yet risen proportionately. Later in his letter, Ambassador Grew concludes, quote, such a national temper is always dangerous. At the time, the Japanese government responded to this economic crisis with obsessive fixation upon domestic social control. Not only did the special hire police, um, in Japanese, the tokubetsu koto keisatsu, target political activists, they also suppressed any public material that they deemed, quote, disruptive to morals or obscene. These materials included sexological texts, instructions on birth control, and any publication that described sex for purposes other than reproduction. Persons involved with sex education, sex research, or the distribution of birth control were classified as politically dangerous and were prosecuted under the Peace Preservation Law of 1925. We know from recent highly publicized scandals throughout the world that any attempt to force others to suppress their sexual desire for an extended period of time often leads to tragic results. Ambassador Gru's assessment resonates. Such a national temper is always dangerous. At the same time as it suppressed its domestic population, the Japanese government increasingly viewed military expansion as the most logical solution to its economic dilemma. In his report, again, Ambassador Gru states, it seems to be primarily this military element who believe that the best way to obscure the facts of Japan's grim financial state is to work the public into a patriotic and nationalistic fervor by representing foreign nations as trying to thwart Japan's efforts for alleged self-preservation. One year after the film's events, the Second Sino-Japanese War officially began, and that eventually expanded into World War II. In 1936, however, the Imperial Japanese Army army had already invaded and seized political control of Manchuria in northeastern China. And back home, the people of Japan were bombarded with messages by their government that peaceful coexistence with other nations was not an option. Such a national temper is always dangerous. And I emphasize the word always, because although in the realm of the senses is set in the year 1936, many of those economic, social, and political factors were still at work when Oshima Nagisa debuted his film in 1976. Due to the sharp increase in oil prices by OPEC in 1973, Japan's economy had plunged into a grave recession. The fact that in the realm of the census was banned in Japan proved that the government was still obsessed with the concept of obscenity. And the Vietnam War, which concluded that year and which Japan played an important role in, reminded us that military campaigns 
were still strongly influencing the collective psyche of Japan. And how about 2015? As Masami Teraoka, Yumiko Glover, and Dr. Fumiko Takasugi and I considered in our roundtable discussion this evening, at least some of those social factors are still at play. As we watch in the realm of the senses, to what extent can we reassure ourselves as individuals and as a nation that we would never be capable of descending into such a state of obsession? After the screening, we'll have a brief Q&A for anyone who's interested. Deep thanks again to those who made tonight's events possible, including film curator Abby Elgar, uh, theater manager Taylor Chang, museum director Stefan Yost, the Robert F. Lange Foundations, and several anonymous donors um, who've contributed generously to the uh, Shunga exhibition throughout it, the past three years. Mostly, thank you all very much for coming, for your time, and I hope you enjoy the film. <laughs>